All right, shall we start? Let's start. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the Center for Philosophy of Science final annual lecture series of this academic year. Um, Mauricio Suarez is currently professor and chair, chair, are you still chair? A professor and chair in logic and philosophy of science at Complutense University of Madrid. And he is also a research associate at the London School of Economics. Um, he began his academic journey by taking a bachelor's of science at the University of Edinburgh in astrophysics. So this might explain some of those things he does. Um, but like many in our field, he uh, was drawn to really more general questions and philosophical questions about science. And so he followed that with taking a master's degree in philosophical foundations of physics at the London School of Economics and also a PhD in philosophy from the LSE. Mauricio stayed in the UK for a while, teaching at Oxford, the University of St. Andrews, spending time at Northwestern in the US as, and as a lecturer at the University of Bristol before he returned to Spain to an appointment at Complutense University of Madrid. From 2013 to 2015, Mauricio held a very prestigious Marie Curie Research Fellowship at the Institute of Philosophy in London. Now, Mauricio was, is not just a great philosopher, which you're going to hear about, but he was also one of the founders of the European Philosophy of Science Association and served as its vice president. And as somebody who is involved in that level of philosophical activity, thank you for doing that, because these are really important things to keep our community moving forward. Mauricio's work is on understanding uh, scientific models, so a big portion of his work is on understanding scientific models, and it's been extremely influential in our field, especially his paper, An Inferential Conception of Science Representation, Scientific Representation from 2004, published in Philosophy of Science. Now, I'm personally a big fan of uh, his earlier 1999 paper, Theories, Models, and Representations, in which he defends a pragmatist account of models against a purely structural semantic conception. Now, what's interesting is, I think it's your most recent work, the one that just came out. Um, the, these themes continue to get developed in his work, and um, his paper with uh, Francesca Pero just came out in Philosophy of Science, and it's entitled The Representational Semantic Conception, where he traces out the development of the semantic approach to theories and its more recent representational interpretation in defending, yay, a broadly pragmatic account of theories. So in addition to his work on models, which is something that I have attended to closely, Mauricio has also contributed much to philosophical discussions of causal inference in quantum mechanics and also to probability. And that's the topic we're gonna hear about tonight on his talk on explanatory chance. Yeah. Thanks, Mauricio. Thank you so very much. Um, thanks, Sandy, very much for the introduction. And uh, I also want to thank the Center for the invitation to speak here in this very distinguished uh, lecture series. Um, and uh, I've been sort of commenting to people during the last few days how um, strange it is for me to to realize that this is my first visit to Pittsburgh, and I, I, I've been interacting with Pittsburgh people throughout my academic life all over the place, and have had wonderful conversations with people connected to this center uh, and, and this um, institution over the years, and it's sort of remarkable that this is my first physical appearance in Pittsburgh. I feel like I've been here in the spirit for a long time now. So uh, what I want to talk about is um, an ongoing project of mine over the last uh, six years or so, where I've been developing um, an account of uh, probability that is uh, uh, unusual in, it, in, the, in the fact that it's e extremely uh, pluralistic. And so this chimes in with some of the themes that are currently fashionable in in Pittsburgh, and I was very glad to sit in, in Sunday's uh, 
inaugural lecture yesterday and just find out how much agreement was uh, there was between what she was saying and what I'm going to be doing today in connection with chance. So the evolution of this project is that I started off by thinking um, about probability in some of the traditional ways in which philosophers have typically reflected upon the topic over the um, 20th century um, along the lines of finding or trying to find an interpretation of objective probability that would be satisfying. And I quickly ran into all kinds of objections. Some of them are very well known already to many of these um, attempts to interpret objective probability and ended up with a number of arguments for why no reductionist account of objective probability would, would do, would work out. And that kind of negative um, conclusions out of this sort of interpretational work has led me eventually to um, undertake a, a different kind of um, um, a project. There's a new twist to the project in the last year or so where I have begun to turn my attention to the practice of a statistical modeling. And so what I want to do today is to bring you up to date with the state of the, of the project as it, is, as it is now by telling you a little bit about the negative arguments from the um, impossible uh, reductive interpretations of probability that I was exploring for a number of years. And that's already uh, published work. It has appeared in a number of different papers that have been published in, in different journals. Um, including the Journal of Philosophy and the European Journal for the Philosophy of Science, and most recently a paper that came out in the British Journal for the Philosophy of Science. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. But I, what I really want to do mostly today is to focus and concentrate on the, on the new twist, the sort of uh, latest part of this project, the one that I'm currently embarked on, and it's a little bit of that is work, uh, work in progress. So you see me sort of uh, advancing some, some new, new ideas, and I'll be very interested in, in whatever feedback you can, you can give me. Um, so basically, let's see how this goes. First, I will begin by setting up the framework, and I want to roughly distinguish between these two different approaches to the topic, the most kind of traditional philosophical approach to the topic and the sort of new approach that focuses on a statistical model in practice. That is the sort of most recent twist of this project that I was talking about. Then I will um, introduce that sort of pluralism about chance that I mentioned before, which is the outcome of my reflections over the years about the um, uh, nature of the interpretation of objective probability that has led me to this sort of pluralism and I'll explain some of the reasons that I think militate in favor of this sort of pluralist outlook on, on chance and then quickly I'll move on to the, to the latest part of the project, the sort of bit of the project that is ongoing now which is all about uh, modeling practice and I want to start by focusing on the kind of work that chance does um, as this kind of plural notion, as I understand it, the, the work that chance does in the context of a statistical modeling. Um, and so I'll center the discussion upon a notion of explanation that has been much discussed in the recent philosophical literature, the idea that uh, models have explanatory power by themselves. And I'll try to figure out how chance can appear as part of the explanatory posits of different statistical model, models. And I'll distinguish roughly between two different kinds of statistical models that one can have in general. And then I'll get into the details of some of the cases that I will discuss. And surprisingly, some of the most interesting and rich cases are the paradigmatic cases. The ones that everybody thinks that we've got them all figured out. Well, it turns out that maybe we should think twice about them because they turn out to be more complex than we thought. And in particular, I'm going to fix my attention on a, on a case that is very well known and very paradigmatic of discussions of chance. And I'll suggest there's a lot of rich um, detail there that should not be ignored. Um, I'll then move on to quickly to a discussion of one particular method that has been used through the years in, in modeling a, a, a type of a statistical phenomenon that is compatible with deterministic underlying dynamical laws. That's the method of arbitrary function. And um, I'll make a similar distinction as to how to think about the method of arbitrary functions as I've done in the first part of the talk about um, general understandings of chance. Um, and I want to wrap up the discussion by thinking about 
statistical modeling in the context of more general modeling enterprises and more generally um, ideas of scientific knowledge that um, are also popular here at Pittsburgh because I'll uh, refer to one um, uh, paper by, by Jim Woodward and Jim Bogan on the nature of uh, saving the phenomenon. I'll suggest that there are interesting connections between the way in which these models uh, operate and, and, and some distinctions that Bogan and Woodward draw, uh, drew out in those papers already many years ago. So and I'll just end up with some very brief uh, conclusions. Um, so let me first of all distinguish these two different ways of going about trying to understand chance. There's on the one hand the kind of traditional way to think about these topics in uh, particularly in analytical philosophy throughout the 20th century and that is to embark on a sort of interpretational um, search about the nature of objective probability. There are different approaches there but they all have in common the fact that they are attempts to answer the question about what in the world or in the mind in reality makes probability statements true. So this is basically an endeavor to locate the truth makers of our probability statements. And many of the so-called philosophical interpretations of probability are attempts to get to grips with this question in different ways. And although many of them are um, mutually incompatible, they're nonetheless different ways of trying to answer this question. So for instance, famously, von Mises defended the frequency interpretation that identifies probabilities with frequency ratios in well-defined collectives, as he put it. That's one way of going about answering this, this question. The Finetti famously and Ramsey answered this question rather differently by focusing on credences or partial degrees of belief. Those would be the truth makers of our probability statements, therefore not real uh, frequency ratios in the real world, but rather states of belief, mental states, putatively degrees of certainty about certain beliefs um, that would make those probability statements true. Popper had a very different answer to this question. He thought that probability statements were made true by real propensity waves that he thought existed and were real out there. The probability statements were made true by those kinds of entities. Um, and this tradition goes on to the present day. There's a whole plethora of attempts to answer this question um, in present day analytical philosophy, including David Lewis's very um, influential best system analysis of chance, which is a kind of twist on the, sub on the subjective interpretation combined with some kind of basic regularity account of, uh, of laws. So these are all basically philosophical attempts to grasp, to get a, a, a grasp of, of the truth makers of probability statements. And while I think that a lot of very interesting work has uh, been done in this, in this area and a lot of very talented people have invested a lot of their um, energies and effort on this, on, this, uh, on this project. I think by and large the lessons, the most conclusive lessons that we can draw from this work are negative. So we have a lot of very good ob objections to every one of these different philosophical interpretations of probability and that tells us a lot about what probability statements are not made true by but very little about what actually makes those probability statements true. Anything N nothing much conclusive has followed from, from this project in positive terms. Um, the second way of approaching the topic, which is the one that refers to the latest twist in, in my project, is to try to uh, come to this, uh, to the nature of chance, and try to address um, the nature of chance very differently as part of the explanatory practices of scientists when they go about the statistically modeling statistical phenomena. So the question that drives this kind of inquiry is not a question in, in the interpretation of probability statements or the truth makers of those statements, but rather a question about practice. What in the practice of a statistical modeling provides insightful models? And I suggest that there is also a long tradition that um, goes about the study in chance um, along these lines, but maybe not so well known by philosophers or that has not been so practiced by philosophers. It mainly originates with uh, Henry Poincaré and the method of arbitrary functions and many of the followers in that school, which include Hopf and, and Eduardo Engel, who published uh, a very complete and influential book on the topic. Um, but also can be taken back all the way to Person. So Person here is, is, looks like a standout figure because obviously he was a philosopher. 
But a lot of what he was doing when he was studying chants was very influenced by his work on the geodetic survey, on the East Coast geodetic survey, where he actually worked as a statistician. In fact, I was told that's the only paid employment he ever had. So, um, so a lot of his reflections on chance are heavily influenced by his practice as a, as a, as a statistician and, and reflect that kind, of, um, that kind of ambition. So what I'm suggesting here is the, the first kind of project is very interesting and we do have a lot of interesting information about the different um, possible uh, interpretations of uh, probability um, but by and large has ended up with uh, a number of very conclusive negative results and that's a project in ontology i, I flash it there in in red because i i think you should be aware that engaging in that kind of project is not going to bring you a lot of goodies the um, other approach is a more methodological approach and uh, um, although it does take account of some of the uh, possible answers to the first approach it sort of wants to go beyond that and wants to make particular contact with scientific practice and, and that I flash in green as an invitation to sort of pursue it which is what I've been doing for the last year or so so red is bad uh, green <laughs> is good <laughs> you should follow the green light and so that's uh, what I'm going to be recommending that we do today okay but let me set also as part of the framework some of the uh, reasons that lead me to begin with uh, a pluralistic account of chance. I basically defend the view that chance is a plural nexus of three, at least three different and distinct notions. And I want to tell you something about how I came up with these views, which in a way also link up to some philosophical discussions. Um, already Frank Ramsey, Rudolf Carnap, Ying Hacking, they're well known for having defended the view that probability is really a complex notion. Uh, at least a dual notion, either because there are really two different concepts of probability or because there are two different aspects towards a very complex concept of probability. In either uh, uh, case, the, all these authors distinguish very carefully between what we call subjective probability on the one hand or credence, which Carnap very helpfully and characteristically um, referred to as probability sub one. Um, and uh, on the other hand, distinguishing that from objective probability or chance, which again, Carnap very characteristically um, unhelpfully referred to as probability sub two, just in employing this famous now indexes. And so pluralism in the philosophy of probability is not really new. Um, there's already lots of um, people who have been defending this view that we should clearly distinguish subjective and objective probabilities. There are at the very least two very different, radically different aspects of the concept of probability, if not completely different concepts, and that we cannot really do away with either of them. We, we, we need both. We cannot really eliminate any of those two concepts. Now, I want to go farther beyond this kind of basic dualistic pluralism and defend the view that um, chance itself is a plural notion. And just as we need to distinguish very clearly subjective from objective probability, we also need to make some fundamental distinctions within what I call the nexus of chance, which are similarly irreducible. So I want to claim, in order to understand how chance works in a statistical model in practice, you're going to need these three different notions that make up this chance nexus. The idea that there are propensity properties, these are fundamental probabilistic dispositions, that chance setups or the systems of interest will have and exhibit, in virtue of which they give rise to a number of probability distributions, which we model in our um, statistical models via distribution functions or density functions. And moreover, these are further tested against frequency data. Um, that is, there are also frequencies, finite frequencies. Many of those uh, frequency data have limiting characteristics or features or long-run features but some of them won't, so frequencies in principle are on this account finite, but nonetheless they must all be distinguished from each other. And what's important here is you cannot attempt to reduce any of these categories to the other set of categories. The three of them will be, will be needed. So why do I believe this? Um, first of all, I think there are arguments coming from the Philosophical Interpretations Project, this kind of negative arguments that I alluded at the beginning of my, of my talk, that militate against any kind of reductionism and therefore militate for 
by default for some kind of pluralism, and they have to do with the impossibility of any of the reductive enterprises. So, for instance, um, von Mises and the frequentists have attempted to um, define probability in terms of frequency to reduce the notion of objective probability to frequencies. I think those attempts at a reduction um, basically meet unsurmountable objections. And uh, by now, it's quite clear that these objections are really so powerful that would make any kind of reduction unviable or impossible, whether it be to finite frequencies, <coughs> hypothetical frequencies, or the limiting frequency characters of some of these. Uh, most prominent, the so-called reference class problem, the fact that frequencies are typically indeterminate with respect to different sets of sequences or collectives, and what probability a single case outcome of any particular experimental trial will have will depend very sensitively on the collective or the sequence in which it is um, enmeshed or uh, as, as it is classified. This gives rise to completely different descriptions of probabilities to the same, um, to the same event depending on which uh, class one uh, classifies it as part of. And the other uh, type of objections that I think are relevant here, people have objected to the reduction of probabilities to frequencies because in our practice, and this is an argument that connects with some things that I want to say here today, in our practices, probability and chance in particular figures with an explanatory role. We often ascribe some kind of explanatory power to chances. What do chances explain? Well, they often explain frequencies or the limiting character of some frequency ratios. So therefore, if, if chances or probabilities in general explain frequencies, they cannot be assimilated or identified to the frequencies that they explain. They must be distinct. This is an, an argument that many people have run against the frequency interpretation of probability. I think it's quite compelling. And moreover, I'm going to make use of it throughout the talk today. So we cannot really reduce chance to frequency. Um, we cannot reduce it to propensity either. And even someone like me who thinks that propensity is, uh, that is dispositional, uh, probabilistic dispositions play a role in, in, in chance, nonetheless, we do not believe that probability or chance can be reduced analytically to propensity. And there are, again, many different reasons um, that support this conclusion. They, many of them have um, are related to something called the Humphreys paradox in the literature, which is a first, an argument first advanced by um, Paul Humphreys that shows that not all propensities can be given a probabilistic interpretation or representation. Uh, we also know that many probabilities are not or do not measure propensities. Propensities sort of have an asymmetric character, um, typical um, perhaps of, of uh, causal asymmetries and although not necessarily always reducible to causal asymmetries that probabilities don't have, so they cannot really be the same thing. Uh, probabilities are grounded sometimes in, on propensities, um, and that distinguishes them precisely from the propensities that ground them, so they cannot be the same thing. So there are lots of different arguments for um, refusing to analytically reduce chance or objective probability to either frequencies or propensities. And I think what this shows is that you really need to think of chance as a complex nexus that has at its heart both propensities and frequencies. Um, now I want to um, explore in the rest of this talk some positive arguments for pluralism. After all, these are just negative arguments for pluralism. Um, what I've argued so far is you cannot reduce chance to any one particular um, entity, whether it be frequencies or propensities, so therefore you have, to, you have to allow it that it's a plural concept. That's a kind of negative argument for pluralism um, by arguing against its opponent. Now I'd like to argue for pluralism directly on the basis of considerations of a statistical modeling practice. So um, this is roughly um, the framework and and what I'm, I'm going to do, therefore, is I'm going to explore a number of examples that bring out this pluralistic character of chance and, and put it um, uh, uh, f uh, uh, the very much at the forefront of um, the analysis of chance. So here are three, three, three examples that are well known and non nonetheless, they are um, unexpectedly rich in, its, uh, in, 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 in the details of how we go about modeling um, these cases. 
Um, a coin's propensity to land heads with a certain probability, or a paradigmatic case of uh, a chancy system or a chance setup. Uh, smoking's propensity to cause lung cancer with a certain probability this is very much thoroughly studied. Um, correlation between lung cancer and smoking, and we by now have a lot of evidence for that link. Um, the propensity for a radioactive atom to decay with a certain probability, with a certain half-life. These are all cases of paradigmatic chance phenomena or chancy phenomena. And I would argue that in all these cases, when you describe them appropriately, the plural character of chance comes out. A coin's propensity to land heads with a certain probability that already distinguishes the propensity from the probability. Smoking's propensity to cause lung cancer with a certain probability, the propensity of a radioactive atom to decay with a certain probability. Moreover, frequencies are implicit in all these discussions. It is implicit that you will go about testing these probabilities by means of frequency um, data. So all these examples, prima facie, already appear to involve pluralism, this kind of plural nexus of chance that I'm talking about. There is already a sense in which you're appealing to propensities, probabilities, and frequencies are, as distinct notions that make up the complex nexus of chance. And what I want to suggest here is that the appearances are really what is there that we should accept those appearances and not try to do away with them. That really, the way to understand these cases is by getting to grips with a complex nexus of chance as it appears in all, these, in all these examples. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to focus mainly on the first example, which is the most paradigmatic of all, the examples regarding chance phenomena. I'm going to argue that it's unexpectedly rich and that you can draw a lot of lessons from it that may not appear uh, obvious at first sight. Okay, so first of all, let me tell you how am I going to address the issue of whether chance explains in the context of these models and how. I'm going to appeal to a very generic account of model explanation, which is nowadays uh, much discussed by philosophers of science. Um, it already appears in the in the Mediating Models book by, uh, edited by Mary Morgan and Margie Morrison. Alisa Bokulic has been developing this account and applying it all over the place. Um, and I'm not going to enter into the discussion as to whether you need to have causal relations modeled by these models in order for these models to actually turn out to be good explanations. I'm going to keep at the very neutral, more general end of the discussion. I'm just going to assume that whatever entities are postulated by these models are explanatory in as much as they are essential posits of the successful models of the phenomena. And this is something that everybody will agree upon, whether they think that, moreover, they are essential posits because they play a causal role or not. So I'm going to keep it at this very generic level, which is the one that suits me best. So if chance is going to play a, an explanatory role in statistical models, it will be precisely because it will figure as an, as an essential posit in the successful statistical models of chancy phenomena. So what we need to understand is how is it that this chance nexus appears as essential posit of these statistical models in order to figure out what kind of explanatory power it has in this context. So the question for me is, since chance is this plural nexus, how do its parts interact in the context of these statistical models so that we can say, we can claim of this um, chance nexus that it is an essential posit in these explanatory models. And so here I think my question is very similar to the question that Sandy was asking yesterday in her inaugural lecture. It struck me when I was listening to her that what I'm here pursuing is an account of integrative practices. That is, I'm really pursuing an account of how do you put together these three different notions in such a way that they felicitously give you a more comprehensive explanation of the phenomenon. Rather than trying to do away with these notions or reduce them to just one single notion, rather look at how they interact in practice. And that's really what I'm going to be doing here here today. So I just claim, I'm going to claim chance explains um, in as much as it figures out as an essential posit in an explanatory model of some chancy phenomena, but at least as, as soon as you make that kind of assumption you can already make some interesting distinctions and I want to particularly draw upon this distinction that I'm going to use in the context of this talk between what I call pure probabilistic models and pure stochastic models. These are two different ways of going about modeling a statistical phenomena or statistical regularities. You can, you can appeal to deterministic laws, underlying deterministic laws, 
and get an explanation of some outcome probability or probability distribution of, over some outcome variables, even at the macro level, by employing microstate uh, probability distributions over the, over the initial conditions over the, over the microstate description of, of the system. This is possible because the deterministic law gets you the probabilities at uh, the level of the outcome, outcomes at the macroscopic level out of the initial probability distributions that you've postulated for the initial um, uh, conditions or the initial values at the micro state level. And this is essentially what those who work in the, in the tradition of the method of arbitrary functions and follow Poincaré uh, do when they do uh, statistical modeling. And, and it's the sense in which we can claim that the underlying deterministic dynamics are perfectly compatible with, uh, with the explanation of some probabilistic phenomenon. But um, you have to notice that here, if you're using the pure probabilistic kind of modeling, uh, one of the essential posets in your chancy explanation is going to be the initial probability distributions over the, over the initial states of the system at the micro level. If you're, if you're, by contrast, if you're uh, modeling some kind of uh, chancy phenomena by means of a stochastic laws, non-deterministic laws, then you don't need to postulate any initial probabilities over the, over the initial states of the system. The laws by themselves already will generate the probabilities over the outcome um, space at the macro level. So um, this is roughly what, what happens in quantum mechanics. People who um, think that quantum mechanics is an, um, fundamentally indeterministic theory, not everybody does. I mean, there are Bohmians amongst us who don't think that, but people who think that quantum mechanics is fundamentally an indeterministic theory um, go about modeling the kind of chancy phenomena of quantum mechanics by means of this sort of model. They employed uh, a stochastic law that will get you the probabilities without having to recourse, having to have any recourse to initial probability distributions over the, the over the over the um, initial states of the system. But you always uh, you always confronted with this choice when you're statistically modeling a phenomenon. You can employ the deterministic laws and the initial probability functions over the initial conditions, or you can employ stochastic and deterministic laws, and then you don't need to postulate as sensual posits of your model any, any probability distributions over the initial states of the system. As I will try to argue, both are legitimate ways of going about employing the concept of chance in our um, modeling explanations of a statistical phenomena. They're very different, and very often you have both kinds of models for the same kind of phenomenon. Okay, so I, I want to pursue this a bit further and, and get into a richer discussion of a statistical modeling practice by looking at how statisticians go about modeling um, the statistical phenomena. And here there's another interesting distinction that I think we have to pay some attention to and that philosophers haven't always paid enough attention to. Um, it's typically thought that a statistical model of any kind of statistical phenomenon is just a pair structure in which you have a sigma field or an outcome space which describes a number of possible outcomes. In the case of a coin toss, just landing heads or landing tails. Um, and you just put a probability distribution over that. And that's a statistical model. You have outcome space, probability distribution on it. That's it. You've, done, you've statistically modeled the phenomena the moment you've done that. Well, it turns out that statisticians have a more sophisticated, if you want, concept of what a statistical model is, certainly richer and more complex, and I think it, 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 it does make sense to pay some attention to it. In this very influential paper amongst the statisticians um, by McCulloch in 2002, where it's a statistical model, he introduces the following definition. He says, statistical model is, is not just an outcome space and a probability distribution over it. It's really a parameterization of a phenomenon a p-function which parameterizes a particular phenomenon. It, it picks up different parameter variables of, that are of interest in the phenomena and then ascribes to every one of those parameters a distribution function over a corresponding outcome space. So a statistical model is a family of probability distributions over a different set of outcome spaces, all of them corresponding to a particular parameter of interest in the description of the phenomena. This is more complex than the, than the conventional view, and I'm going to suggest it's important to fix attention, to fix our attention, pay attention to the parameterization of the phenomenon that underlies any statistical model. Because here it's going to be critical how is it that you describe the phenomenon in the first place and parameterize it in order to get the statistical 
um, model out, the probability distributions are going to be very sensitively dependent on your parameterization. This is not something that is always appreciated. But statisticians know this very well, and they know this to be the key um, to any successful statistical model of any phenomenon. They also understand that it involves judgment. So there's some kind of what they call the art of a statistical modeling. It's about picking up the right parameter space for any um, given uh, statistical phenomenon. So here's, for instance, David Cox, who is one of the uh, big um, uh, popes of uh, statistical inference, um, writing in 2006, formalization, it, which by formalization he basically means the parameterization of the phenomenon of interest, is clearly of critical importance. It's what translates a subject matter question into a formal statistical question. Um, and that translation must be reasonably faithful and as far as feasible, you see lots of judgments are going to be involved here, about how you carry out this translation. As far as feasible, the consistency of the model with the data must be checked. How this translation from subject matter uh, problem to a statistical model is done is often the most critical part of an analysis. So I suggest that we should pay um, attention to this kind of parameterization of the phenomenon of interest and then the kind of family of probability distributions are going to be associated to each of the parameters of interest. This goes on in most successful <coughs> statistical modeling. Okay, so now what I want to do is um, I want to look at the examples in detail and I'm just going to look at one of the examples because even if it's this kind of famous and people think very simple example, it has all the rich complexity that you need in order to study the, the plurality, the, the plural nexus of chance and its explanatory power. So in the case of the coin toss, it's conventionally assumed, following the conventional way of understanding a statistical model, that the only thing you need to do in order to model the statistical phenomenon that is involved in tossing a coin is to ascribe a probability distribution to landing heads and landing tails. That's, that's it. That's a statistical model. It's just a probability distribution for heads and tails. If the coin is fair, if you have reasons to suspect that, maybe reasons out of the application of the principle of indifference or out of some kind of consideration of the symmetries in the coin, then you will be led to ascribing that probability distribution. That is, that heads and tails are equally probable, they have 50% probability. That's what it means to say that the coin is fair. And to statistically model that is just simply to give that probability distribution to the coin to the coin outcomes, to the possible outcomes, the heads and tails. So this would be the simple rendition of what a statistical model is, but as I've suggested, to actually provide an intricate and detailed statistical model of something as basic a phenomenon as tossing a coin is a lot more complex than that because it's going to involve you choosing a parameterization of the phenomenon of interest. And that's going to add a lot of complexity. So what is it that happens really when we model the phenomenon of tossing a coin. Even within classical mechanics, I'm not adding any kind of extraneous complication to this example. The basic classical mechanical model of tossing a coin is more complex than you think. So, um, the best account that we have is um, you're going to employ a number of idealizations in describing the motion of the coin. You're going to take the coin to be lying along that AA axis, so the radius of the coin is 2A, and subtending a, an angle theta to the, to the vertical. And this is what um, Keller has done in his very, very well-known paper amongst the statisticians, 1986, in the American Journal of Statistical Physics. Um, a time-parameterized model of the coin's motion from ejection to landing um, will need to employ a number of assumptions. And these are Keller's assumptions. And they're not innocuous. There are a very large number of idealizations involving how you describe this model. So this is an adequate parameterization of that system to get you the right probabilities um, at the end. So you're going to assume the coin's radius is A. You're going to assume the coin's thickness is negligible. In other words, this coin has no thickness. That's an idealization. Um, you're going to assume that the coin's center of gravity is its precise geometrical center of gravity, um, geometrical center. Um, and that basically assumes that the coin is not biased in its construction um, in any way. And critically, assumes that it's not bent in any way. Um, and that um, center of gravity is found at a particular height, which we're going to describe as, as x at time t. The coin is initially at, at the height a from the surface at time zero. Importantly, the coin does not rebound. That is, its landing position is final. This is obviously very, very important to describe the, the landing um, of the coin appropriately. And 
very importantly, the coin's angular velocity remains constant throughout. So it's basically um, rotating at the same angular velocity throughout its motion. And this is obviously also an idealization. It's not going to be fulfilled in any case of any realistic um, coin to us that we know. As long as there is friction with air, and friction with air is definitely going to vary along the along the trajectory, so that is uh, definitely an idealization for any real coin toss that we know. Now, if you put in place all these idealizations, that you can describe, you can parameterize the system appropriately. You can describe what I would call its uh, propensities, its dispositional probabilities, and you can get some interesting results. Because now the only three parameters in your model are the angular velocity and the upward velocity. Everything else is fixed. So the only thing that you decide when you eject um, the coin is the angular velocity at which it will constantly rotate throughout its motion, and the upward velocity, the velocity that will be, you will be throwing it upwards, which can also change. But everything else will be fixed. Now, if you make these assumptions, then it's possible to show that the Newtonian mechanics of the coin's motion determine some pre-image areas in the initial phase space of the angular velocity and the, and the upward velocity for the corresponding outcomes of landing. That is, depending on the initial upward velocity and angular velocity, you will get heads or tails at the end. And any sufficiently smooth probability distribution over the initial three parameters is going to give you the well-known probability distribution for heads and tails at landing. That is, you're going to recover the 50% probabilities for the outcomes for a fair coin by making these assumptions if you just assume a sufficiently smooth probability distribution over the initial um, values of these two free parameters. So what you can show is that a coin toss of a suitably idealized coin like this will give you probability 50% for heads and four tails, independently of considerations regarding the symmetry of the coin or any application of the principle of indifference, just by assuming a kind of random distribution over its initial position, which is just a smooth probability distribution. The only condition that you have here, this is something that people working in the method of arbitrary functions have discussed at length, is that the distribution be sufficiently smooth. And if you just make that assumption, uh, Poincaré claimed the probabilities that you get at the end, at the end are perfectly um, uh, objective. They're objective chances, even though, of course, Newtonian mechanics, the underlying uh, dynamics is deterministic. You get chances out of a deterministic system by just running this suitably parameterized model. Why is that? Well, that's because if these are the pre-image areas um, for the coins, so you have uh, angular velocity over here and upward velocity over here, and this will be heads, this will be tails, this will be heads, this will be tails, this will be heads, tails. Um, depending on how you move upwards in the pre-image space, you get heads or tails as the, as the outcome of the coin toss. If your initial probability distribution is sufficiently smooth over this, then at the end it washes out. So what you get is 50-50 chance for heads and tails. But you need the pre initial probability distribution to be smooth. It cannot sort of peak here then not here, then pick here again, then not here, then pick here again, because otherwise you're just going to get heads as opposed to tails with a much higher probability. So that's what's work, doing the work here. That's what's doing the explanatory work here. The smooth probability distribution over this suitably parameterized version of the phenomenon gives you the right probabilistic outcomes at the end and explains the frequencies of heads and tails in the coin to us of, a, of a fair coin. Okay, so I've employed the method of arbitrary functions in going about providing this statistical model for a very basic chancy phenomenon, um, such as a coin toss. And you may wonder, well, maybe there are also different approaches to the method of arbitrary function. Indeed, there are. Some people have tried to discuss the method of arbitrary function as a suitable or potential interpretation of probability to add to frequencies, propensities, and so on. That you will have this additional interpretation, and this would be an explanation of what probability statements are made true by. Uh, people like von Kries, who was one of the uh, one of Poincaré's predecessors, and Reichenbach in his doctoral dissertation, which was all devoted to this method of arbitrary functions. Most recently, Jan von Plato in a very nice historical review in the BJPS. They all were after um, this kind of um, approach to the truth makers of probability statements. They were all involved in some kind of ontology. Um, I want to suggest that there's another way of looking at the method of arbitrary function as an explanatory practice. 
in modeling from the point of view of methodology, whatever provides an insightful model. And indeed, Poincaré leads um, this kind of inquiry here. He was very determined to apply this methodology in all kinds of different models for statistical phenomena. And those who have followed his lead, like Hopf and Engel, have also been working in this kind of methodological approach. So that's what I want to do with the method of arbitrary functions. It's a way to uh, provide pure probabilistic models for statistical phenomena that um, show you how, in, in practice, chance works as a, an explanatory posit. So this is what's going on in this case of the Keller model for the uh, coin toss. You have some initial distribution. In this case, it's just the angular velocity and the upward velocity. You define some suitably smooth probability distribution over them. You just run at the, at the dynamical loss. These are deterministic loss over those. And you get the suitable probability distribution over the outcomes at the macro level at the end, heads and tails, 50-50 chance. The dynamical loss here are acting on the properties of the system as described in the model, which again, I repeat, is a highly idealized model of the system. Um, and therefore, if you're going to think of the propensities or dispositional properties of the system here, you must include both those micro-level properties as defined in the model and the loss. So this is something that I've been thinking about a lot recently, that in these cases, in the method of arbitrary functions, the propensities are suitably dynamical because they, include, they must include the dynamical loss. That's the way to make sense of the underlying properties or propensities of, of the chance setup. Then there's an invariance. You can show an invariance over a range of suitable initial distribution functions. As long as they are smooth and continuous, they have to satisfy some minor conditions. They all account for the output probabilities of heads and tails. And so therefore, this is explanatory precisely in so far as it's resilient or robust under changes in initial conditions. No matter what the probability distribution is at the beginning, as long as it's a smooth and continuous, it's going to give you 50-50 heads and, and tails for this particular system as parametrized in this model. Um, OK, but then you may wonder, what about um, if I change the conditions um, and, and describe the system differently or change the conditions, if the conditions in the idealization are no longer applicable? And indeed, this is what happens when the coin is unfair. So what do you do in those cases? You have to change the entire model description. Some of the assumptions, idealizing assumptions, won't apply, for instance, to a bent uh, coin, which is the uh, which is the actual, the, the actual case that is going to give you a divergence in the probabilities of landing heads and tails. People think that if you um, weight a coin differently, um, you're going to get a difference in heads and tails, or if you eject it differently, you, you don't. The way to, um, to bias a coin is by bending it. Um, if, because if you bend it, then the center of gravity doesn't agree with your metrical center, and also that already assumes that the coin has some thickness for it to be bent. <laughs> Well, the new model description breaks down this resiliency that the old idealized parametrization exhibited, and that's what's going to give you the different outcomes. So you're going to get a different outcomes for heads and tails. And this is explanatory in as much as different counterfactual or less idealized descriptions or parametrizations of the system will yield different probabilities over the outcomes. So I argue there's two different kinds of explanatory power that chance is giving you here. On the one hand, there's the resiliency, that's part of the method of arbitrary functions. Then there's the kind of counterfactual account of explanatory power for chance that is an explanation of how when you change the parametrization of the system, you get a different set of probability distributions at the end. Both are explained by the chance nexus. Okay, you may think a smoking cancer it doesn't fit this bill because after all, that was a simple case of just establishing a correlation. And after you had the correlation, you knew exactly what was causing what. Well, actually, I think it fits the bill rather well. Um, uh, Dull and Hill made substantive assumptions about the underlying mechanics that would generate uh, lung cancer out of smoking. Nowadays, we have a very full picture of what the propensity pro uh, uh, properties or probabilistic dispositions are of the um, in, um, of the ingestion of a smoking and, the, and what the smoking produces in the body. Here's the full picture the latest um, account of the kind of mechanisms that underlie that correlation. So far from just establishing that causal connection out of correlations alone, you had again some kind of complex plural nexus of chance at work in determining the probabilistic outcomes that then went on 
to establish those correlations. And similarly for radioactivity, I think radioactivity is another case. You cannot just reduce the kind of um, half life and rates of decays of the of the atoms to to pure propensities. You have to have them both in place. The, the fine grain uh, description of the uh, fine structure of the atom is what gives you and grounds the half life. Uh, sorry, the, is what grounds the the half lives for the different kinds of particles. You have a pretty good description of the mechanisms that underlie that. Um, and so, therefore, you need, on the one hand, to have the propensity pro uh, properties of the system. On the other hand, the probabilities that sort of grounds, and finally test that against the frequency data. I think the nexus of chance is also involved there. You cannot do away with any of those three notions. So basically, I'm arguing um, um, chance appears as an essential posit, as a plural nexus in all these statistical models of phenomena, uh, however simple they might have looked to you at, at the beginning. Um, and I want to end the talk by, by suggesting um, that this fits in well with a kind of general account of modeling and theorizing that um, uh, comes all the way from, from that Woodward and, and Bogan paper, although many others have adopted it in, different, in other different ways. Uh, one way of thinking about these distinctions is in terms of the distinction that um, Jim Bogan and Jim Woodward made popular between theories, uh, phenomena, and data. So if you think about the, the chance nexus as I've presented it here, it sort of fits in nicely with this distinction. Um, there's something that is explanatory about the propensity properties that appear in the chance nexus. They are typically described by scientific theories. Think of the case of the atom, but also as we've seen in the case of the coin, you need the deterministic dynamics of Newtonian physics to run those propensities. So I, I would venture that propensities appear as posits of theoret theories or theoretical models. Um, the kind of distributions or formal probabilities that I've distinguished in this chance nexus from the propensities are part of phenomenological descriptions or phenomenological models. And finally, of course, there are the frequencies or the experimental probabilities, and those would be akin to the data points um, in the tripartite uh, Model. So what I'm arguing here is that they operate very similarly, um, these distinctions in the chance nexus to uh, notions that we already comprehend quite well and understand well in the relationship between theories, explanatory theories, phenomenological models, and experimental data. Um, my way of thinking about these distinctions uh, nowadays is roughly as follows. I'm, I'm exploring the, the view that um, the propensity properties of chance setups ground the probability distributions, and that's what happens in something like the Keller model for the coin toss. You're appealing to these highly idealized descriptions of the properties of the coin in order to ground the probability outcomes, heads and, and tails. And together, that, that those two parts of the model explain the long-run features of the, of the experimental data. So they explain why your coin toss tends towards a steady distribution of heads and tails along the lines of 50-50. That gets explained, therefore, by a combination of the propensities and the formal probability distributions in the, in the model. And that's what's playing the, the main explanatory, explanatory role here. Um, and I, I argue that this applies to the coin toss and the system, uh, the, the classical mechanical system for, uh, for the coin, but it also applies to smoking and lung cancer. There's a way to make these suitable distinctions also in that context. And it also applies to radioactivity, where people may have thought we don't have good theoretical probabilities or propensities, but I think that quantum mechanics gives you just that, from which you derive formal uh, probabilities that you test against uh, frequency data for every kind of, uh, um, of radioactive material. Um, so that's my, my, my current way of thinking about how to structure this chance nexus in such a way as to exhibit uh, most clearly its explanatory power in the context of these statistical models. The overall um, lesson is therefore this, that in the, for instance, just to, uh, to apply it to the case, to the case of the coin, so that's the, one, the only one that I'm going to, to, to explore here. Um, this is going to lead you to the idea that the coin's propensity to land heads, this is the kind of set of properties that the coin has under the suitable idealized parameterization that Keller gives us. It does not really explain why a particular coin lands heads or 
um, tails on a particular toss. That would be like a, attempting to explain a single data point by means of a theory. We know that it's not likely to be uh, successful. Uh, but it does ground the single case model probabilities for outcomes in any given tri trial. So it tells you why that particular coin has the chance 50-50 on any experimental trial. That's, what, that's part of what the model does. And the model as a whole, the, the Keller model, that is the idealized description of parameterization, the distribution function that you get at the, at the end for heads and tails, and the dynamical law, then together they explain the phenomena. That is, they explain the frequency um, of heads, or at least the long run limiting character of that um, frequency data. So that's how I'm currently thinking about um, the structuring this, this chance nexus so that you can reveal the full explanatory power that chance has in the context of, of these of this models. And I've just here used um, the coin toss example, therefore only the underlying deterministic dynamics. This is a pure probabilistic model in my terminology. But I, I claim you can run the same kind of distinctions for the smoking lung cancer case and also for the radioactivity case, where you can also have a distinctions of this sort and pretty much the same lessons will, will apply. So it, it sort of clarifies a little bit what it said that these models do explain or attempt to explain and on the basis of, of what. So I just uh, want to end by recommending more work along the lines of this, that is exploring the, the practical role that the chance nexus plays in the statistical modeling. Um, and in these two traditions that we've uh, been exposed to in understanding chance, I, I, uh, I, I don't um, think there's a lot more that we can learn from engaging in the interpretation. And we've learned a lot um, from this endeavor, but I get, um, at least as far as I go, I, uh, I have reached my limits. But there's an awful lot to learn um, from the methodological approach to the explanatory role that the chance nexus has in modeling practice. And I just would like to advise people um, to join me and do some of this, do some of this work. Thanks very much. <laughs>